Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai. Welcome to lesson 21 for introductory physics. This lesson is going to look at pressure and Archimedes principle. So we've looked at uh, pressure already. We've talked about what pressure is, but now we're going to talk about it a bit more in terms of fluids and gases. Uh, and we're going to also introduce buoyancy, the idea of something that wants to float rather than sink. Uh, so as usual, we'll jump over and we'll get started on our lecture slides. So the goals are, Explain and calculate the buoyancy force for a submerged object. Explain Archimedes' principle. Explain the cause of pressure from a gas. State Boyle's law and apply it to simple scenarios. Describe an ideal gas and describe a vacuum. Uh, as we saw with the previous lesson, we're not going to get into too many formulas, uh, too many calculations. There will be a few, uh, a few formulas. But a lot of what we're going to be doing is talking about things qualitatively, so understanding systems and ideas and how things behave, uh, but we're not necessarily going to put mathematics onto all of them. First part is buoyancy. So buoyancy uh, is another one of these words where everyday language and science have similarities, but they're not exactly the same. So in physics, any object that is submerged experiences a buoyant force, uh, which we're going to define and calculate. But in everyday language, we often talk about something being buoyant, meaning it wants to float. And, uh, and so there's this slight difference there, because even objects that sink still experience a buoyant force, even though in everyday language, we wouldn't say that they are buoyant. Uh, so anyway, that out of the way, let's have a look at what we're talking about. We've already met pressure. We've talked about pressure being force over area. So it was just a way to distinguish forces when they were applied over a large area versus a small area and we know intuitively that has made, that does make a difference and so pressure allowed us to think about that <clears throat> with a solid or something sitting on the ground you stand on the block you apply more pressure onto the block the block can't sink into the ground so it doesn't move uh, so what's happening to the atoms within the solid well they're all being compressed uh, we've already met compression so pressure is very similar to compression, as I hinted at in the last lesson. Compression is pressure within a block, or within an object, essentially. So compression is just this pressure that's trying to squash the block. Uh, in solids, we don't often talk about pressure for solids. Uh, even though it's there, even though it's easy to figure out, uh, we don't often do it. We do if we're talking about deformation or elasticity. Sometimes we might want to talk about pressure because if you have a very large sponge and you push down on the whole thing versus pushing down just in the middle, then that's going to be different, uh, a different result, uh, whether you compress the whole sponge or just part of it. So the pressure will be relevant, not just the force, the area over which you are applying it. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to do much, but something to think about. I've labeled it as discussion, but many of you probably won't have someone to discuss with. Feel free to post on the forums if you want, but it's not that in-depth a topic. It's just the idea of how pressure comes into play when designing seating for outdoors. As you can see there, the top image there is a standard wireframe chair and the leg has just sunk straight into the ground. And the bottom one is a camping chair with a little zoomed in part, um, part of the image showing the foot of the camping chair and how it's just got some extra features on, that, uh, on the feet of the chair. Uh, so a simple thing to discuss and think about. If you aren't sure, feel free to ask, uh, pop along to a tutorial or ask a friend, uh, or of course, post in the forums is uh, acceptable too. In fluids though, pressure is a much more utilized concept because we can actually put things in the middle of a body of liquid. You can hold something under water. And so that means that the pressure that exists in that fluid is gonna be pushing everywhere on that object. Uh, so the pressure applies in all directions, right? The, the, if you hold something underwater, it's not just water pushing down on the top, there's water pushing sideways on it too. And there's even water pushing up because the water underneath would try and be where the object was if the, if the water around it is trying to push down and push that stuff up, it's all sort of moving. Basically, water wants to get into where that object is, that object is in the way of the water, and the water wants to get in from every direction, is the point. We already talked about pressure in a fluid being rho gh. This is still perfectly true. We're not changing that at all. Pressure is still rho gh. Of course, as we talked about, that is the change in pressure as depth of a fluid increases by some distance h. Uh, there are, of course, external pressures you may need to take into account. So if you are one meter below sea level, 
then rho GH will tell you the pressure due to the water at that one meter depth, but there is also atmospheric pressure pushing down on the top of the ocean, which would increase that pressure right through the ocean by that atmospheric pressure amount. So you need to remember to take any external pressures into account. If you've ever lifted anything underwater, which uh, most of us will have at some point when you're going swimming uh, in a river and you lift up a rock and it seems easy enough to lift up and then suddenly you get it above the water level and all of a sudden it's really heavy. If you've even experienced that, then you have experienced the buoyant force of an object. When we submerge something underwater, then there is force in every direction. Uh, we're going to think about each of those forces now for a moment. So let's think about something really easy to calculate, like a brick. Uh, I chose a brick because it is a rectangular prism, and that means our forces are all going to be nice and easy to calculate. Remember that we said the pressure is pointing in every direction, pointing inwards on the object. It actually points perpendicular, so it's just like a normal force. Remember, normal forces are always perpendicular to the surface of the object. It's exactly the same for the forces due to the pressure in a fluid, exactly the same. So if you've got a object like a brick or a cube, then the force on each side is pointing directly perpendicular to that side. Still pointing inwards, but perpendicular, which makes our calculations easy to do. So let's think about the force on the ends. <clears throat> the force on the ends is actually going to be changing as you get deeper, because remember rho GH, the height of water above the top of the brick is different than it is at the bottom. And as you go down, that pressure is getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the way down. Uh, it's getting bigger linearly, so we can still easily calculate it. But remember that the pressure on the other end of the brick is exactly the same. So the if you draw like a tiny strip at the top of that brick on the end pushing inwards, then there'll be a force pushing inwards exactly the same on the other side equal to it. Next one, the force will be a little bit bigger, but there'll still be an, ident an identical force pushing in on the other end. And it will go, go the same all the way down. You end up with a net force on each end, not net force on the whole brick, just on the ends. The net force inwards on each of the ends is the same and opposite. So the net force on the brick from the ends is going to be zero. All right, so no net force from the fluid pressure on the ends of the brick. The two sides is exactly the same process. It gets higher, the force, uh, the pressure, and therefore the force applied to the brick gets higher as you get further down the brick from the top to the bottom, but it's identical on the front and the back of the brick. So we have no net force from the fluid pressure on the sides. So that means there is no horizontal net force on any submerged object. And that makes sense because if you hold an object underwater, regardless of whether it sinks or floats, which is what we're going to talk about in a moment, regardless of that, it doesn't just flow sideways suddenly unless there's a current in the ocean. Assuming you're in a smooth stationary pool of water, you let it go, it will either sink downwards or float upwards. It will not go sideways. Right? The only reason it will go sideways is if there is some kind of current or fluid flow causing it to move, which would then be a net force. Now let's think about the top and the bottom. So the top first, the pressure on the top of the brick is perfectly downwards. Remember, perpendicular to that surface, so it's straight downwards. The pressure is the same everywhere across the top because the top surface of that brick is all at the same depth underwater. So the top is the same area, uh, everywhere. So the force is gonna be the pressure at the top, whatever that pressure is, times the area at the top of the brick, or of the top of the brick. So that is the force downwards on top of the brick due to the water above it. However, there is also a force on the bottom due to the water underneath the brick. And that is just going to be equal to the pressure at the bottom of the brick times that same area A, because the area at the top and bottom of the brick are the same, uh, assuming we have a nice rectangular brick as I have drawn there. So we have this force downwards and this force upwards. And these are not gonna be the same because we know that the pressure at the top of the brick is less than the pressure at the bottom of the brick. So that means that we have a higher pressure at the bottom, uh, I'm just reading the words there. It looks like I've got a bottom of, yeah, okay. I thought I'd written it back to front, but I've drawn it, uh, written it correctly. So the fluid at the bottom is at a higher pressure than the fluid at the top. So we get a bigger force upwards than we do downwards. So we have a net force upwards. Remember, this is just due to the fluid pressure. We're ignoring weight force at the moment. You know, we will come back to that. But for now, we're just talking about the force due to the pressure uh, of the fluid on the brick. So there will be a force upwards. This net force upwards is called the buoyant force, and it exists for any object that is submerged under a or in a fluid. 
it may not be big enough to make the object float. Right? That depends on how big the weight force is because you, to get the actual net force on the brick, you have to include all the forces, not just the ones due to the pressure from the fluid as we've done here. So depending on the weight force, the object may or may not float, but it will always have a net upwards force due to the fluid, and that is known as the buoyant force. If we take an object and we submerge it, so here we've got a green block, we stick it underwater, the volume of that water will increase, or it will appear to increase, and that's because we've got the same volume of water, but now it's got to make an empty space big enough for that green block to occupy. And so that extra volume of water goes up above where it was originally. Right? So the water level will rise. The amount it rises must be exactly the same as the volume of the object. That's the only thing that makes any sense. If you put the block under water, then the water must make room for the block. And so the water will have to increase uh, the, the volume will increase overall. Uh, it's basically saying the volume of the water plus the volume of the block is still the same before and after. And if you know the volume of the water before and the volume of both after, the difference must be the volume of the block. So that's actually a very useful method for determining the volume of irregular objects. Uh, and I believe your next lab will have a part of an experiment relating to that. Um, but it is a fairly simple process to just check how much that water volume increases and therefore determine the volume of the object. Uh, so if, just as a quick example, uh, which will be very much like what you do in your at-home lab, if uh, I've written orangey block, but it's clearly a green one, so I'm not sure what I was uh, on there. We have a greeny block in the diagram. It's put into a square container. The edges are four centimetres long and the water rises by one centimeter, then that means that the volume of the water plus block is four by four by one or 16 centimeters cubed bigger than the volume of just the water was, because the water level's gone up by one centimeter. So the volume has gone up by 16 cubic centimeters, and that means the volume of the object that we added must be those 16 cubic centimeters. Let's return to that buoyant force again for a moment. That buoyant force, you can think of that as the force of the water that you've just made get higher than it was before. When you put that object underwater, the water that was in the place the block is now occupying has all been pushed up and that pushed the next bit up and so on. And so the water level has risen, which means you now have a volume of water equal to the volume of that object that is now above where it was to start with. It's been pushed up out of the way. But that water doesn't want to be up there, right? want in the, uh, not, not the actual sense, it doesn't have desires, but it doesn't want to be up there because gravity is pulling it down. And so gravity is pulling it back down. The amount that gravity pulls it back down is equal to the force that the water applies on the block to try and push it up out of the way, because that's all the force it has. That's all it can do. It can only push down as much as gravity pulls it down. Right? And so gravity pulls the water down. The water is using that pull down to try and push the block out of the way. And that's where the buoyant force comes from. That's just another way to think about it, uh, if that helps. Uh, so that's, that's one way to think about the buoyant force. It's just the water trying to push the object out of the way. If the weight force of the object is greater than the buoyant force, then the water can't push it out of the way. The buoyant force isn't enough to accelerate the object upwards, so the object will stay sunk and the water will just have to be higher. But if the buoyant force is greater than the weight force, then the water will be able to push the object up, the object will end up on top of the water, and the water will be back down the bottom where it wanted to be as it got pulled by gravity. Uh, Archimedes' principle, is this idea that an immersed object is buoyed by a force equal to the weight force of the fluid it displaces. Right, so that's what we've sort of been hinting at, just as we looked, uh, the, uh, I'll go back a slide for that diagram. That object gets uh, submerged, some of the water goes up, and the water that's above where it was originally is equal to the volume of the object. That's what we were just saying. When you submerge the object, it has to make room for the object, so that amount, that volume of water, that is where the block is now, or was where the block is now, that volume of water has gone up above the original water level. So that's how much extra water height there is, and that mass of water is what's being pulled down and what is trying to push the block out of the way. So it all sort of ties back in together. And Archimedes is the one that realized this, and he put this all together in his principle. And the idea is just that the weight, the buoyant force on the object is equal to the weight force of the fluid displaced by the object. So you take the volume of the object 
and then you say that volume of the fluid, what's the weight force of that? And that'll be the buoyant force on the object. It's that simple. The buoyant force though is the same at any depth. Right? That's, as we just saw, the buoyant force depends on the volume of the object. We didn't say anything about how far you had to submerge the object. It only depends on the volume of the object and the density of the water or the liquid that you're putting it into. It doesn't care about the depth. Uh, an example uh, is if we've got a brick 10 centimeters high and it's submerged to the bottom is at a depth of one meter. The pressure at the bottom of the brick is 9,800 Pascal, while the pressure uh, at the top is only 8,820 Pascal. Remember, this is the pressure due to just the water. We would have to add atmospheric to get the total pressure. But all we care about is the difference because we've got the same area, top and bottom. So all we care about is that difference. And we see that there's a difference in pressure of 980 Pascal when this brick is submerged to a depth of one meter. If we instead submerge the brick to a depth of 100 meters, then we're going to have bigger pressures, but the difference is still only 980 Pascal. So the pressure increases linearly with depth, so therefore buoyant force doesn't care about how deep the object is submerged. It only cares about the volume of the object. Uh, I do expect you to grasp that concept, the idea that the depth doesn't actually matter, just the volume of the object and the density of the fluid, uh, because it's the difference in pressure between the top and bottom of the object that actually matters, not the total pressure. However, I will add in a little caveat. Remember, we were talking about compression and deformation. If you have an object that can deform with pressure, then getting deeper will make a difference because it will squash or compress the object. And as you compress the object, then its volume decreases and therefore the buoyant force decreases, but its mass is still the same. So in that sense, you can have an effect on the, on the depth, uh, sorry, the depth can have an effect on the buoyant force uh, if the object can be deformed due to the pressures involved in being underwater. However, again, we're not going to go into that in this course. That's slightly beyond what we do, although the concepts are all right there. There's nothing to stop you at all thinking about that. What about flotation? So this, as I said, in everyday language, we talk about something being buoyant. We often mean this. We often mean flotation, an object floating. So what is flotation? Uh, we've just talked about things being completely submerged. So what about something partially submerged like a boat? Archimedes' principle is still true. The buoyant force is still equal to the weight of the fluid that does get displaced. But now, the amount of fluid getting displaced is not the same as the volume of the object. The volume of the water displaced is going to be less than the volume of the object. Right? Uh, so we've got diagrams there, not submerged, fully submerged, and partially submerged. You can see not submerged has got no net forces on it. Uh, we've got, uh, sorry, no buoyant force on it, so it's just got the weight force, and so it will accelerate downwards as shown by the red arrow. Therefore, it will sink into the water slightly. If we've got a fully submerged object, but one that wants to float, then the buoyant force is going to be greater than the weight force. We're going to have an acceleration upwards. The object is going to go up. So if you held in something that wants to float underwater, then release it, it will accelerate upwards. You've probably done this in a swimming pool where you hold a bouncy ball or an inflatable ball underwater, and you force it underwater, and then let it go and it accelerates upwards and bursts out of the water. And that's because it wants to float, and so the buoyant force is much greater than its weight force. However, there will be a position where the two are equal, and that will be partially submerged. It is when the object has pushed enough water out of the way that the volume of displaced liquid, I should say liquid, not water, because it works with anything, any liquid, the volume of displaced liquid is the same as the volume uh, that, no, I've got that wrong, uh, it's using the wrong words, the the weight of the volume of the displaced liquid, there we go, the weight of the volume of the displaced liquid is the same as the weight force of the object itself. Right? Because remember that weight of the volume of the displaced liquid is the buoyancy force. So if you've got an object that pushes out two newtons worth of water and it has a mass, a weight of two newtons, then those are balanced and it will float there. Right? But the object might be bigger than that. And that is what floating is. It is when something pushes out enough water to have a buoyancy force as say, the same as its weight force, even though the object uh, would, um, would take up more volume if it was submerged. Uh, sorry, I'm tripping over my words here. I'm not sure why. It's a fairly simple concept. Uh, you've got partial submersion means, uh, is, means that it's floating, right? It's pushed out 
partly, I'll push board a part out of the way. Why can't I say these words? Okay, uh, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Hopefully you've all got that. I'm not sure what's going on with my brain there. Uh, so the idea of sinking or floating is simply the idea of whether or not this object has a weight force greater than the buoyancy force it can experience. Remember the buoyancy force determined by its volume. Uh, so if we've got weight force and volume, then we're talking about density, right? We're talking about mass and density and gravity. So if the object is more dense than water, then it displaces water equal to its volume, which will have mass less than the mass of the object. So the buoyancy force on the water, which has less mass than the object, the buoyancy force is going to be less than the weight force of the object. So the object will sink net force downwards. Uh, obviously, once it reaches the seabed or the pool, bottom of the pool or whatever it's in, then it will stop going downwards because it's now going to experience a normal force from the surface as well. That normal force, of course, will be less than the normal force it would experience on dry land because it still experiences the buoyant force. The buoyant force is just not enough to make it float. If the object is less dense than water, then if it is displaced, uh, if it displaced water equal to its whole volume, then the water would have bigger mass than the object and it would experience a net force upwards. So that's when it would accelerate upwards and it would float. Uh, in reality, it will find that partially submerged position where the buoyancy force and the weight force are equal. An object with the exact same density as water will neither float nor sink. It will be in force equilibrium at any depth because the force on the weight force on the object is going to be exactly the same as the weight force on the fluid it pushed out of the way because that fluid has the same density. So therefore it's pushed out the same mass as it has and since gravity is the same on both, the weight force on the object and the weight force on the displaced fluid are going to be the same and the object will not sink nor float. It will be perfectly in equilibrium anywhere. So some examples of buoyancy. Remember, all you need to do is compare the density. If the density is more than water or more than the oil, then it's going to be in uh, more than whatever it's being put in, then it will sink. If, it's, if the density is less, then it will float. If it's the same, it will do neither. And uh, that's what we call swimming in the case of fish. Now, so all of these are to do with water. So water is around about a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, as we've already met. So these are all being placed in water and we'll see that which ones float or sink. Pumice is 250 kilograms per cubic meter, which is much less than a thousand, so it will float. Steel is greater, it will sink. Fish will swim. Iceberg will float. Pine wood will float. Stones will sink. And humans are slightly less dense than water on average. Uh, and so in general, humans float, but there is a bit of variation depending on your muscle to fat ratios and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and also there's slight variation in oceans around the world. Some higher salt uh, have higher densities and humans float better and so on. Uh, so they do tend to float, humans tend to float, uh, but it does vary slightly. A couple of interesting little subjects though on the topic of flotation and buoyancy is uh, first of all fishies. So fish have about the same density as water as we just said, so they can, uh, they can swim around. There's no net force on them either up or down. Uh, of course, remember I mentioned that the deeper you go, the greater the forces and you can get some compression going on. So you, fish do have certain depth uh, environments that they like to live in. Deep sea fish withstand these great pressures and their density at that great pressure, pressure after they've been condensed, their density is about the same as water. Uh, whereas the fish that live higher up in the oceans with less pressure and less deformation, their density is still about the same as water. But if they went down lower, they would be too dense and they would sink. And if the lower ones went up too high, they would get, uh, they would expand and they would be less dense and then they would float and that wouldn't be very good for them either. Uh, so they do sort of have these environments that they live in. Uh, as I said, we're not gonna, I don't expect you to know all of this. This is just a little interest topic here. The interesting part is that they have an air bladder. Fish have this bladder inside them that they can fill up with air. And if they inflate it, then they increase their volume. And if they increase their volume without increasing their mass, they decrease their density. So they'll have a net upwards force. So they can actually force themselves up and down just by inflating or deflating this air bladder uh, and rising or sinking accordingly. So they don't necessarily have to swim themselves up and down. They can just in inflate or deflate. Submarine is a very similar concept, yet the opposite to what we just talked about with fish. So submarines are the opposite. Their volume is fixed, but they can change their mass. What they have is these tanks inside them, 
which they can open up to fill in with water or they can pump water out of. And if they open it to add some water in from the ocean, then that means their mass is increasing. If their volume is constant and their mass is increasing, their density is increasing and they'll get a downwards force. Uh, if they pump that water out, they become less dense than the surrounding water and they will float. They'll get a net force upwards. So submarines can surface and sink by adjusting the amount of water in their ballasts. Uh, so the principle of flotation is the last, I think it's the last concept for this lesson, uh, we'll see. Uh, the principle of flotation is just a formal statement of what we've talked about. The floating object displaces a weight of fluid equal to its own weight. Right? So because an object that sinks still displaces a volume of fluid equal to its own volume, right? if it's more dense than water then it will sink as we just saw, but if you can shape it so that it displaces more water or more liquid than it, uh, than it needs to in order to float, then it will be able to float. So that's why we have hollow boats. So boats can be made out of steel. Steel normally sinks, but by making it into a bowl shape or a hollow shape, it pushes more water out of the way than it, uh, than it has its own uh, the mass. This is where I get confused, right? I'm not sure why. The weight of the water that it pushes out of the way is greater than the weight of the steel itself. And so the steel bowl shaped thing can float. Right? So that's what the principle of flotation is. It's just that you have to somehow push enough water out of the way so that your buoyant force is equal to your weight force. And we can do that by manipulating things that would normally sink, like making a hollow shape out of something heavier than water. Uh, heavier than water, as I just used that phrase, that's the common language definition of heavier than water, meaning denser than water. When we say something's heavier than water, we mean it's more dense and it sinks. So steel is heavier than water in that sense. I should have said something denser than water to be physics, uh, physics-y. Oh, there is another section. I forgot about the pressure in a gas section. So pressure in a gas, uh, we've just been talking about fluids. Uh, fluids are technically gases or liquids, so it's exactly the same idea that you've got this pressure. But what is pressure in a gas? In a liquid, it's fine, you've got, you've got literal, literal liquid atoms pushing on the walls of their container, and so that makes perfect sense that there's gonna be this pressure because you've got atoms pushing on it, and you put more atoms on top, i.e. put more liquid in, now you've got more pressure pushing downwards, and so the pressure increases everywhere. That's fine, but what's happening with a gas? The molecules aren't just sitting there pressing against the sides of the containers, they're flying around. They're not just sitting there constantly pushing. So it's slightly different to what we saw for a liquid. What is going on? Collisions are going on. If you fill a balloon with water, the water molecules are literally pressing against the surface of the balloon. They keep the balloon expanded. If you breathe into a balloon, if you fill it with air, or use a pump or whatever, then the molecules inside are flying around, but as they do so, they will collide with the surface of the balloon, the interior surface of the balloon. That collision, right, the collision where the molecule hits it and travels back away the other way, has, it results in a change in momentum for the particle, the air particle or molecule. That change in momentum requires an impulse, i.e. a force. Right? So there's a force occurring between the, the particle and the inside of the balloon as it collides. That force is what causes the molecule to fly back the other way, but it also keeps the balloon expanded. And there is enough of these collisions going on constantly everywhere that that balloon can stay expanded. Right? So in reality, it sort of goes in slightly and then moves back out because it gets collided again. Uh, but it's just happening so much, so constantly, that to us it just looks like it's just a solid, uh, not solid, but a, a nice consistent uh, standard shape. But in reality, it's just all these constant collisions everywhere uh, from all the particles inside. And of course, outside it as well, because outside we've got atmospheric pressure. And so there's air particles bouncing off the outside of everything. And that's true of everything all the time, as we saw with atmospheric pressure. Uh, so atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere is 101 kilopascal, which is 101,000 newtons of force per square meter. That means that there are many, many constant tiny collisions occurring all the time between the atmospheric particles and any surface. So you, your desk, your chair, your floor, everything, buildings, walls, windows, everything is under this constant pressure from the atmosphere. Uh, 101,000 newtons of force. Uh, and we're talking about these tiny, tiny atoms and molecules. Remember how small they were, right? 10 to the negative 27, 30, uh, tiny, tiny amounts of kilograms. 
but there's so many of them constantly colliding, constantly changing their momentum, and thus constantly imparting a force on the object they're hitting, that we get this constant pressure of 101,000 newtons per square meter. Uh, pressure does change with gas depth, uh, but that's it's a pretty small amount. Right? We saw with liquid, as you go down, then the, the liquid above is all pressing down on that bit of liquid, so the pressure is bigger here than it was up here. With a gas, the gas isn't all sitting on top of each other like it was with a liquid, so the gas doesn't really change. The gas, uh, it, you do get slightly more towards the bottom and indeed with atmospheric pressure we do see that because it's a big enough scale that the air pressure at the bottom near the earth's surface is a lot greater than it is by the time you get up to the tops of mountains and things but in most scenarios the change in density of a gas is pretty minimal so we will just about always treat gas as being at a constant pressure right, so unless we're considering a really big system like the atmosphere we will assume that the gas in our system is at a constant pressure since we know the pressure comes from collisions between the gas particles and the container they're in, we can start to think about ways to increase or decrease that pressure. So if we want to increase the pressure, we need to increase the number of collisions or make each collision more forceful. Those are our two options. Those are how we could increase the pressure and decrease just the opposite. So if we increase the number of collisions, well, we could just put more gas into our container. If you've got a canister and there's so many, so many collisions happening every second and you put twice as much gas in, now there's going to be twice as many collisions, right? So we'll have a higher pressure. Uh, we could also decrease the volume of the container. Now the particles can't travel as far before they hit the container and so they're going to be hitting it more frequently. Right? So either of those will work for increasing number of collisions, which is increasing the pressure. You could also increase the force of the collision, uh, and that's determined by the kinetic energy each gas particle has. Right? Remember we said the uh, momentum related relates to the force, or the change in momentum relates to the impulse, which relates to the force. So if you've got a bigger momentum, and therefore a bigger change in momentum, uh, the collisions that we're talking about are elastic, so that's why I mentioned kinetic energy, because that's going to be conserved as well. Uh, so if you've got this bigger change in momentum, you can have a bigger force, and therefore you're going to have a greater pressure. So even if you had the same number of particles, same number of collisions, if each collision requires more force, then you're going to get a higher pressure. But we haven't talked about the speed, uh, the kinetic energy of these particles yet. So we're going to discuss that next week. Uh, well, next section, I should say. But we have talked about volume and we have talked about what pressure is. So we can think about changing the volume of a container. If you change the volume, you decrease it, uh, then the particles are colliding with the surface of the container more frequently, so the pressure will decrease. Right? The, everything else about the particles is still the same. We're, they're traveling with the same speed, uh, but they, and the, so the average force from each collision is going to be the same, but the pressure is greater because they collide more often because they don't have to travel as far, well, they can't travel as far before they collide again. And it turns out that this, uh, this relationship is as stated, the volume times the pressure is just a constant. So if you increase one of them, you're decreasing the other. This is assuming everything else stays the same. So assuming the amount of gas in your canister stays the same, assuming the temperature stays the same, uh, assuming that's uh, pretty much it, um, then you've got pressure times volume is constant. So uh, this little formula is called Boyle's Law. It is one I'd expect you to be able to use. Um, it's nothing too complicated. If you know the pressure here and the volume here, and then you're told the volume here is half of that one, then that means that you must have doubled the pressure. I'll actually jump over to the document camera just to hopefully expand on that idea a little bit. Uh, so I'm just trying to expand the screen. There we go. So if you've got uh, some volume V1 and you decrease it to some volume V2, which is a half of V1, and if you had a pressure. P1 here, and then you want to know what P2 is here. So let's say P1 was equal to uh, five atmospheres here. You decrease the volume to a half. What's the new pressure? Remember that P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. Uh, the one we don't know is P2. So we can say that P2 is going to be equal to P1 V1 over V2. Right, so that's five atmospheres 
times v1, which we don't know, but we do know that v2 is equal to a half v1. So we can cancel out the v1s. So we have five atmospheres divided by a half, which is the same as saying multiplying by two. So two times five atmosphere, which is 10 atmospheres. So the pressure here would be 10 atmospheres. Uh, and that's, that's what we were just saying with Boyle's law. If you halve the volume, you must double the pressure. It goes from five up to 10. That's because the particles can only travel half as far before they collide again. So you get twice as many collisions, and therefore twice as much pressure. So I would expect you to be able to use Boyle's law in very simple scenarios like that. I'm not gonna get you to do anything super complicated with it, but I do expect you to understand the concept. Uh, the concept is more important than the formula specifically, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the idea that if you decrease that volume, the pressure is going to increase. That should be something that you just automatically think. If you've got a gas, you've got a pressure, or due to the gas, and you're changing the volume, you should be thinking, Boyle's law says, if I decrease that volume, the pressure is going to get bigger. If I increase the volume, the pressure is going to get less. Right, that should be, hopefully, something that you don't really need to think about. In that you need to think about it lots now so that you don't need to think about it too much when we get to problems, if you get what I mean. Anyway, getting sidetracked. Uh, so, which gases obey Boyle's law? Uh, turns out that it's actually only true for what we call an ideal gas, uh, but studying gases gets very complicated and we're not going to deal with the messes that come up as we get to non-ideal gases. Uh, so luckily a lot of gases can behave like ideal gases if we have certain restrictions on them. And those restrictions are that we don't make the gas too hot or too cold and we don't introduce too much gas into a small space. If you make the density too high then even though it's a gas if you force enough particles in it starts to behave more like a liquid because the particles are just too close together like we get in a liquid. So with those restrictions, if we say, all right, don't make it too hot or too cold and don't put too much gas into too small a space, then we can use Boyle's law. And again, it's not gonna be perfectly true as we see with a lot of things in physics, but it will be pretty close to being true. If you remember Archimedes' principle that we just saw earlier in this lesson, the idea that an object that is submerged in a fluid is buoyed up by a force equal to the weight force of the displaced fluid, that's true for gases as well. If you've got a balloon, then that balloon is displacing some amount of air. The density of air tells us how much the weight force of the air that's been pushed out of the way is, and the buoyancy force on the object will be equal to that weight force of the displaced air. It's the same idea, same calculation, same processes, but because gases have such low densities, Water, remember, was 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, but air is only 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. Right, a whole cubic meter, if you, if you map out a whole cubic meter, uh, it's, it's hard to do, I know, but just imagine a whole cubic, if you have a meter rule, great. If you don't, just uh, try and guesstimate how big a meter is. Draw a cube that's a meter by a meter by a meter. Just uh, mark it out with your hands. That volume of air is only 1.2 kilograms. That volume of water would be a thousand kilograms, but for air it's only 1.2. So the forces are not going to be anywhere near as large. They're still there, but they're not large. That is why when you do want to, uh, to use that buoyancy force, you need to make really big objects, things like hot air balloons or blimps. Uh, they need to be really big because the amount of air displaced needs to be huge in order to get those forces to be big enough to have an impact. Uh, and vacuums, vacuums are the idea that you take all the gas out of some location. So that uh, what's pictured there is called a vacuum bell jar. And what we do is we pump the air out of that jar. We take all the air out. And once there's no air left in there, there's nothing to do any collisions. So there's no pressure on the inside of the jar. Uh, and that is called a vacuum. In reality, we often only make, manage to make partial vacuums, which isn't really a thing. A vacuum means no pressure at all. So a partial vacuum, how do you partially have no pressure? You don't, it just means very low pressures. So uh, when we get in labs, we get down to very low pressures. So like a few percent of atmospheric can be achieved, uh, which is not a vacuum. There is still gas, there is still pressure, but we'll call it a partial vacuum because it's, it's less than atmospheric. So we're part of the way towards a proper vacuum. Uh, the difficulty of course with vacuums is that you need to think about the idea that the atmospheric pressure will still be pushing on the container the whole time from the outside. When you've got atmospheric pressure on both sides, 
that's fine because you've got gas pushing out on the inside and pushing in on the outside. Those forces are going to be pretty balanced. There's not really any net force on that shell. But if you remove all the gas from the inside, you've still got gas pushing on the outside, then that's going to try and compress it. It's going to try and crush that shell. So those vacuum bells need to be very structurally sound in order to be capable of maintaining vacuums without collapsing. That's the end of that lesson. Uh, a bit of bit of jumping around. We looked at pressure and then at buoyancy and also talked about how that works with pressure and a gas, buoyancy and a gas, and also introduced Boyle's law. Uh, we also defined vacuums in there as well. So a few different concepts to cover, uh, but all sort of related under the umbrella of pressure.